I buy a ticket, but you can bet they're watching the show. So we don't gotta tell them there's a lot they already know. It's in the words we say and everything we do. The treasure that we chase, it's all the living proof. Yeah. It's like the curtain rises every time we walk in the room. So let your spotlight show everywhere I go. Let the way I live, let the whole world know. So let your spotlight show everywhere I go.
things come to life. This is where the desert soul gets flooded and dry bones start to rise. This is where the withered heart finds water and never has to thirst. This is where faith is met with faithfulness. Get ready for the search. We want to win.
won't kick down, light won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, light won't tear down. Come on, church, sing it again. Let me hear you sing it. There's no shadow you won't light up. You won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Come on, sing it again. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Come on, that's the God we serve. to live in the past, but I think it's also so important to never forget the first time that that reckless love came in and found us. See, it's so cool to be a part of the 99, but being a part of the 99, we can't ever forget that we were the one. At one point in time, we were the one that was selfish, that was broken, full of shame and self-guilt and doubt and, and all this stuff. We were the one that that reckless love came in to find, to save to bring back into his good care and his good arms. Casey and I were talking this week, and, and, and sometimes there's a, a pendulum that's, you know, uh, of, of accepting God's love and, and realizing that. And I think a lot of that, the verse said, um, I couldn't earn it and I don't deserve it. And I think a lot of times that's how we view God's love, but without any more revelation to it. Yes, it's true. I couldn't earn it and, and I don't deserve it, but he still loves me anyway. It is still there for each and every one of us. I, I went a totally different direction at 9 a.m., and now I feel so strongly to go this way of, yes, it is true that you couldn't earn it, and there's nothing, it would, no matter our church attendance, no matter how much we come in here, how much we pray on our own or reach, like we're never going to 
earn the love of God, but you need to know that that reckless love of God is for each and every one of us, all right? There's no one, there's no one that's too messed up that his love won't reach, all right? Uh, it, it, I know we hear it so much, but uh, it, it's almost a little, I think it's a little narcissistic to think that, like, somehow we are above accepting God's love. Does that make sense? Like, somehow we think we're the, the, the special occasion or something that, that well, the, his love is for him, but how could it be for me? No, his love is for each and every one of us, all right? Each and every one of us, his love is there for, and, and it's so important to accept that. And, and, and there's a, it's not a but, it's an and. It's so important to realize it is there for us and we couldn't deserve it. And not but we couldn't deserve it and we keep that mentality. Is that making any sense at all? I hope it is because it feels like it's not landing, to be honest. But uh, let's, just, uh, let's just sit here for a moment and just, and just hear from Holy Spirit. And uh, God, we thank you for your love. And God, I pray that there's... Uh, God, that there's just new revelation for us of your love. Because, God, each and every one of us have experienced your love in the past, but, God, you're not a one-and-done deal. God, you don't just bring us into the kingdom, and then that's that. God, you bring us into the kingdom, God, and we get to just have new revelation of your love. New revelation of your love, Lord. Each, um, Lord, just each season in our life, God, you pour that out. I, I feel very strongly, if you've been following the Lord for a while and, and you know what his love feels like, but you just kind of need a new, just a fresh touch, a new outpouring. I know we're kind of getting that, like that Christian language a little bit, but um, I just feel like God's love is here, like for us to have new revelation of it. And uh, if that's you, I, I just want you to lift your hands for a second. God, pour out your love. Yes, absolutely. God, let us never take your love for granted, but God, let us not let us settle for the love that we've experienced. God, because you, you want to go deeper, God. You go from glory to glory, God. You want to pour it out more and more. So, God, I just pray new revelation of your, uh, of this reckless love, this offensive love that we sing about. And God, we just, we just thank you for being in this place. And God, we just love and glorify your name. Amen. Amen, guys. We'll give it up for this band really quick. Yeah. How about, how about Andrew up here? Huh? Sometimes they, hey, before you sit down, before you sit down, I was so excited. Uh, Pastor Amanda and I came back uh, from our vacation, and I was so excited to see y'all that I even hugged Megan, even though that's her rule not to hug her. So right now, I want you guys all to hug each other, and at least seven people hug Megan over here because she loves it. Hey, for real, go shake a hand, hug a neck real quick. excited to be here today. Amen. So uh, if you're new here, our senior pastors are uh, on a vacation, taking a vacation, getting rested up. And uh, Pastor Amanda and I, the student pastors here, we have been on a vacation in which we did not rest up. We came back so we could get rested up, and uh, but we had a fantastic time. We almost overdid it, to be honest. We were gone too long. We were getting homesick. And uh, it's kind of one of the old, you know, the cliche of you don't know what you got till it's gone. And uh, man, I just, I was so excited to come back and be my home, but also, you know, our church home. Like how cool it is. We, we got to go to a great church out there. It's called Bethel Church. It's uh, a very large church, got a lot of campuses um, in, in a lot of different nations as well. But um, y'all, they don't, they don't got nothing on our church for just that home feel to it. And it's, uh, it's really something that we have going for us. And that's why I was so excited to uh, hug everybody when I got here today. So uh, we're going to take up an offering real quick. Get the, brown, the Browns to come on down. 
they normally clap for the ushers, and they didn't. I don't know what's going on, Harvey. I mean, dang. Kenley's going to help them out as well. It's very sweet. Uh, before I take up the offering, uh, just a few things I wanted to share from our trip. Uh, actually got a lot of prophetic words. Um, Eleanor got prophesied over. It turns out they said that she's going to be a singer. And uh, yes, she's going to prophesy to people as she plays and sings. So don't know who she's going to get that singing gift from, but, you know, I guess it's from God. All right. So what he says, he will sustain. So, uh, but no, and then one of them was for our church too, because uh, that's a lot of, uh, you know, that's, that's how, that's how one of the right ways I know that it was so authentic, the words that I was getting. It's not just a prosperity thing for me. It benefits the people around me. And uh, the Bible actually says that, that the prophecy is for the edification of the church. So they're not just building me up, they're building up what I represent. And uh, I went there, I think, representing, Amanda and I went there representing this church. And uh, so we got some prophetic words about the church as well. And one of them that really stuck out was that old wells are going to be redug. And um, and I really believe that, you know, I don't want to say, you know, revival's coming and all that, but I, I really believe that the best is yet to come for this church. And uh, he's going to do a new thing, but it's not anything new to him, if that makes sense. And it might not even be anything new to us. It might just be a... Um, little have have a little nostalgic feel to it but uh god is up to something god is up to something and it again is just it's so cool to be a part of it to to have a place called home and um amen somehow that translates over into the offering normally i'm good at segues i didn't have nothing right there so we're going to go ahead and give in our offering amen can i get a whoop whoop right there yes praise the lord and uh of course you can give cash or check the old-fashioned way like me um, also, I got in trouble uh, by Chris Lunn in the 9 a.m. service. But So I went out to my graduation. Uh, that's where we were on a trip. So I graduated um, from the first year of the program. Thank you, Chris. Um, but then they let me know really quick I wasn't the only pastor on staff that graduated this weekend. So Tiffany Goins. We honor her. She gets a special shout out, so we are going to have a graduate recognition May 21st, uh, but we just wanted to honor her as well. Uh, just, I mean, what a testimony it was, and if you guys don't know, her cap said there's so much more to the story, and man, is that a fitting statement, uh, because she did not claim victim status. She was truly an overcomer. Casey's going to talk about that more, um, but she set out on a goal, and God provided God provided, but she still worked her tail off. You better know that for sure. So, um, but again, we just honor her. And then, of course, the guy's going to be bringing you the word today. He graduates later on in August. And um, so we honor them real quick. Amen. And again, I have no idea what that has to do with offering, but praise God. Let's go ahead and do that now. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much, God, again. Thank you for uh, place to call home, God. I say it all the time, but man, oh man, I, Lord, we pray for a new revelation of your love, but Lord, we pray for just a, a revelation of, of what you've given us here, God, Lord, this community of believers, and uh, God, I, I know that I am so very thankful for them, Lord, and I pray that, uh, um, Lord, that we, we just are thankful for one another, God, and what you, are, what you are doing here in this church, God. It's not just us getting together as a social club, God, that you are actually in the midst of us working doing something. So God, we just bless this offering. I ask you just to use it for your will and uh, bless it in its abundance. In Jesus' name, amen. everybody how are y'all doing this morning while Ben did not uh, reveal to y'all as he brought somebody new with him with him this morning give it up for Ben's beard this morning um, it's pretty nice I like it um, I like the change it's pretty cool whoa that's hot in here ain't it a little hot um, so I am your PK for the next two weeks I come from a long line of PKs there was Pastor Ken, and then my brother, Pastor Kenneth Chris, was here, and then Pastor Kelly, and then me. So 
I'm who you got for the next two weeks. Like Ben said, Pastor Kelly and Denise are away on their anniversary. Is what they're on. They got to go on an Alaskan cruise. Man, that sounds so amazing. I can't wait. Me and Tiffany are going to go someday. But that means I get the honor and the privilege to speak to y'all this morning. So um, I got a lot to unpack, so let's just get into it. Um, Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done this morning. God, I thank you that your reckless love pursued us into the wilderness. Wherever we went, God, it pursued us, God. And you never gave up. No matter what, it was there. And it was like Ben said, it was almost offensive, the depths you would go to to save us. So we just thank you, God, for what you've done in our life. And if, God, there's somebody here that hasn't met you, we pray that they come to the revelation that you're there to save them as well. And we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So are y'all doing good this morning? All right, let me ask a question. Has any, any of y'all ever had something happen to them that was, made you want to just totally crawl inside yourself and just disappear? That made you, uh, maybe it was your kids that did it. Maybe they acted crazy in Walmart. Maybe they did something stupid, but made you totally want to retreat. Well, I had something like that happen, well, all the time. But the instance I'm going to tell you about is who came to Centuries? All right, it was great. I played Caiaphas, the high priest. I was the bad guy. And uh, Thursday night, it goes without a hitch. The play goes great. Uh, Friday, it goes great. Saturday, great. I'm giving what many have said is an Oscar-worthy performance. (laughs) I mean, it is good. Sunday, 9 a.m., it is great. Sunday, 11 a.m., I'm doing my thing. We get to the scene of the adulterous woman. Katie is the adulterous woman. She gets drugged down here. I improvise a line because that's what Oscar winners do. They improvise. <laughs> so I, I did my improvised line, and then I stood up to face Jesus, which is Corey right there. And I told Jesus, I said, Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of a duh, 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 of a <laughs> And I short-circuited right there on stage. I could see myself behaving in this way, and there was nothing I could do about it whatsoever. It's like God factory reset me right here on stage. (laughs) And it was so embarrassing. I got, Ben was like, the Holy Spirit must have been here because I was on stage. I did not hear anything that happened, or I would have died laughing. (laughs) I'm looking into Corey's eyes as I'm a duh of a duh of a duh, and Corey is, man, he is playing the part of Jesus good. I'm thinking, he probably thinks, man, I just want to heal him right now. I, I just need to heal him, you know, like heal the spirit of Mel Tillis on him. <laughs> so it's not done then. So we get home and give a shout out to our media team. <laughs> well, we stream all these things live. So that means there's a copy forever. <laughs> so we get home and my wife and Macy and my kids, we get to replay this experience over and over and over. And over, and Ken, Kenley's like, rewind it. Did you hear that? Go, of a da, 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 of a da. I thank you so much, Kenley. That, you're really inspiring. But we've had those moments, or we've had those segments of our life that made us totally withdraw. That's a funny instance, but we can have those times, those things in our life that make us totally turn inwards, and we don't want to come out. They make us get lost. Do we have any um, outdoorsmen in the house? Love the outdoors? Uh, Okay, cool. Outdoors women. I am sorry. I didn't mean to exclude you. That's cool. I know Stacy Harris, the Harris family, are really, they love the outdoors. They are hunters. Uh, Stacy Harris, if you dropped him in the middle of a long-lost rainforest with a case knife, he would come out with leather that he had killed from an animal new uh, stuff, uh, and he would weigh 10 more pounds and his beard would look as good as ever. (laughs) I am not that dude. I am not the guy. There is a reason Stacy is good at that, because he's prepared. He's done that his whole life, right? See, the culture we live in has done a really excellent job of marketing outdoor brands and stuff like that. If you notice, sometimes I'll wear North Face, Patagonia. I try not to. I've I've bought a few Patagonia hats, and it's like they make them too small for my head. It looks like I'm wearing a Patagonia yarmulke. It looks so weird on my head. But I like Patagonia. I like North Face. I like Timberland shoes. I like all that stuff. But here's the deal. 
If I put on my best Patagonia threads, I put on my North Face jacket, I put on my Timbos, I buy a $300 backpack and I put on a toboggan, and you drop me in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness, I will not survive. I promise you that. Just because I buy all the stuff that makes me go outdoors, does that mean I am prepared for that adventure? I am not prepared for that adventure. See, I don't have the experience needed to survive any of that. There needs to be preparation, right? Training and then an aptitude to be able to apply all that to that particular scenario. And I'm, I'm not that guy. See, we romanticize the outdoors. I think we got shows like uh, Yellowstone. I know y'all might not say you've watched it. I've never seen it. We got any Yellowstone fans in the house? All right. I believe Kevin Costner could go into a fight with a bear with pure dances of a wolf's charisma, and the bear would end up on the bottom. He is that dude. He's the quintessential outdoors frontiersman. So here's the deal. We got shows like Survivor. Anybody watch Survivor? There's a show on Netflix called Alone that's a, another survival show. And then there was this, it wasn't really a survival show, kind of an animal show that I personally loved where he would go around showing you different wildlife. Anybody watch The Crocodile Hunter? Yeah. This snake right here has enough venom to kill a whole heap of people. She's a beaut. Oh, you're a naughty girl. You're naughty. <laughs> Man, when Steve Irwin died, I felt like I lost a friend. You know it. I love that dude. But there's something about the pioneer spirit, the adventure, which calls out to us. But the problem is, a lot of us are not prepared for the wilderness. See, the wilderness is a vast and wild place that is both breathtaking and life-taking. Life this brings me to my inspiration for the next two weeks. See, I'm a sports enthusiast. I love sports. If you know me, I love sports. I watch it all the time. Matter of fact, me and Bo watched, uh, he was rooting for the Lakers. I'm rooting for the Warriors, and the Warriors happened to get blew out last night. And, um, you know, God wasn't in that, you know. <laughs> but I love sports. And a few months ago, I was watching the Pat McAfee show, waiting on Tiffany to get out of the doctor. And I'm waiting for Aaron Rodgers to make a decision of, whether he's going to go to the Jets, stay with the Packers, or retire. And, I, and I'm glued to my phone like this. I'm looking at it. And Aaron Rodgers, if you've ever followed him, is a kind of a cerebral type guy. He's a, some would say he's a strange cat. He's very interesting anyway. And he tells of how he arrived at this decision. And he goes into saying he spent three days and three nights in a sensory deprivation room with nothing at all, no light, no sound, nothing except him and his thoughts. I thought, man, that thought right there arrested me. Total isolation to get clarity. That's weird. You know, sometimes our isolation can cause more damage than it can. We don't get clarity. So this thought arrested me, and God planted a story in my head that I've heard several times, but... I thought, started thinking about it in a different way. You ever heard the story about when Jesus goes to the wilderness to be tempted by Satan in Matthew 4? See, if you don't know the story, I'm going to give you a refresher anyway. Uh, Matthew 4, 1 through 11, what we know is he gets baptized by John, then he gets led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Him and Satan have a back and forth. Jesus is ultimately triumphant, and then Jesus goes on to pursue his purpose. So we're going to start in Matthew 1 and 2. Stay with me, screen person. Kelsey, you're not just a screen person. You're Kelsey. Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. That's where we're going to focus on for right now. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit to the wilderness. See, our interpretation of the word Wilderness belies the danger behind the word. Wilderness in the Smokies. Anybody had a family outing there? Wilderness in the Smokies? Or you've watched the show with your kids, the backyardigans? Into the thick of it. And I don't know why I needed to do that when I signed it, but I, it just felt good. But the wilderness actually translated from the ancient Greek, which is used in the Bible, actually means this. It's the word eremos. 
And it means solitary, lonely, desolate, uninhabited, deserted by others, deprived of the aid and protection of others, especially of friends, acquaintances, and kindred. All alone. See, Jesus, Jesus and Aaron Rodgers' isolation got me thinking. See, when we think of temptation, usually we think of outside influences, right? I know my parents, when I was going through my stuff as a teenager, thought the friends that I hung around was directly related to how I was acting, and rightfully so, some of that is. There's an automatic connection between our brain and others and people in temptation. But the Bible says that Jesus went to the wilderness to be tempted, the solitary, lonely place where there is no one, devoid of contact, no family, no friends. Anybody ever been in a room full of people and felt absolutely alone? See, here's the deal. I think Jesus knew the biggest temptation we will encounter, the greatest conflict we will ever have, is not with external forces. It's from that desperate, desolate part of us that's having that internal dialogue that can either bury us or carry us. See, the real battle is up here. The real battle is in your mind. There's a girl named Julianne Kepka. She was 17 years old back in 1971. This was Christmas Eve. Julianne had grew up in the Peruvian rainforest. She grew up there with her parents. They operated a reserve in the rainforest. So she grew up preparing for life in the rainforest. Well, Julianne was taking a flight back home. It was Christmas. She was going home, and it was just her and her mother. She was going to meet her father. They're already mad because the flight has been delayed by seven hours, but they get on there, and they're going. Well, they enter a dark cloud on the flight. Anybody been in a dark cloud that made you just not know what to do? Well, they, she said they entered into a dark cloud, and suddenly they start to feel turbulence. The plane is moving in an unnatural way, even more so than it usually would. And the next thing Julianne sees is a strike of lightning outside the plane, and the engines start to fail. Luggage, gifts, Christmas presents start to fly all over the plane. And then Julianne's mom says, oh, my God, this is it. This is the end. The next thing Julianne knows, she is outside of the airplane. The plane is completely burst open. She is hur hurtling towards the earth, two miles above the earth, strapped into her seat. The next thing she knows, she's waking up. And she thinks, oh, my God, I'm alive. Thank you, Jesus, I'm alive. And then she immediately thinks, oh, my gosh, where's my mom? Where's everybody else? What do I do? Her training kicks in. Julianne um, unstraps herself. She starts to survey her wounds. She assesses the situation. She knows she's got a broken collarbone, severe lacerations to her leg and her shoulder. And later she would find out she had a torn ligament in her knee. But she kept going. She surveyed what was around, and all she could find was a bag of candy. And then she started to move towards water. That's what her dad had always taught her. Life is near the water. So you go towards the water. She only had one shoe, mind you, because she had been separated from the other one. So she kept that one shoe so she could do this in front of her because she knew that snakes and other things would camouflage herself. So she kept that one shoe. Where her dad had told her, hey, piranhas will only attack you in shallow water. You need to be deep. So she does what her dad tells her. She gets deep in the river. She starts to drift down river. This is days. She's drinking river water. She's eating candy, and that's all she has to sustain herself. She feels completely alone. Nobody else but her in the world. And she doesn't know if she's ever going to see her dad, her mom, or anybody else. But she keeps going. The next thing she sees at about day six or seven is a king vulture. And she knew it was a king vulture because of her time on the reserve. And she knew the only reason the king vulture was around because there was decay in the air. King vultures hone in to the scent of rotting flesh. So she started freaking out on the inside. What was she going to see next? A little bit later, she comes up on some plane seats that are buried into the ground. Fearful that it might be her mom, she gets a stick and looks at the women's feet. Knowing that her mom didn't use toe, toe polish, she's seen, she seen these people did. She was immediately relieved and then felt ashamed because it was somebody's mom. She keeps, she keeps going. She keeps going down the river. At day nine, she washes up on shore, and she is almost hallucinating. She is malnourished. She is to the point where she is about ready to die. The wounds that she has, she's about to get overcome by them. She washes up there and looks to her side, and she thinks she's hallucinating. She sees a big boat. 
Julianne puts her hand on the boat, and it's actually there. So she has a shot of adrenaline. She gets up. She surveys the land. She sees a trail going into the jungle, and Julianne goes there, sees the little hut. Well, she goes in there. Nobody's there, and what she knows is that hunters use these huts, and they might not come back for weeks, but she knows there's people around somewhere. So she starts to look at her wounds, and she's looking at this one that's starting to get infected, and she said maggots had started to infest this wound right there. So her dad had had a, they had had a dog, and her dad had treated this wound by pouring kerosene in her dog's wound. She's like, she siphoned the gas out of the boat, poured it on her wound, and she said the pain was excruciating as the maggots started to retreat back trying to get away from the gas. She said she picked out like 30, 35 maggots, and she was so proud of herself for having achieved this. But afterwards, she passed out, whether it was from sure exhaustion or whatever it was, she didn't know, but she passed out. The next thing Julianne knows is that she wakes up to the sound of voices. And some men come in. She said, they must have thought I was like a river goddess or something because there was this little white girl in a hut right there all beat up. And she's like, I spoke to him in Spanish and said, hey, I'm a survivor of the crash. They immediately clothed her. They gave her food, and they got her to the nearest civilization. A day later, 10 days later, after the immediate, after initial crash, she is reunited with her dad. She had hung on for 10 days in the rainforest with nothing but water and candy and pure will to survive. They never, they found her mom, but her mom was dead. Matter of fact, nobody survived the crash except her. See, the thing that separated her from all the other people and that people that survived these kind of situations, it was preparation. Her parents had prepared her for life in the wilderness. See, even though she could have never imagined this tragedy would happen, her parents had prepared her for it. See, have you ever heard the expression, nothing could have ever prepared me for that? Whether it had been a death or something or, or, or divorce. Nothing could have ever prepared me. Well, here's the deal. It's not if you're going to encounter the wilderness. It's when you are going to encounter the wilderness. And are you going to be prepared? Are you going to be prepared? Well, here's the deal. There is a way you can help prepare yourself. And Jesus in the Bible kind of lays a road map out of how you can prepare a survival guide of sorts for the wilderness. And here's your first fill-in. Surround yourself with those that intercede, not impede. And what I mean by that is you need people around you that are praying into the void for you because there's some people that are prepared for the wilderness or there's some people that's already been to the wilderness and you need those people on your side praying into your situation. You need people that are going to prepare. Here, we'll call it a search party. You need those people. This brings us to our next scripture, Matthew 3, 1. Jesus had a cousin by the name of John the Baptizer. For my Baptist friends, we'll say John the Baptist. But he had a friend. We'll just call him JTB, okay, Brent? <laughs> JTB. But he had a cousin. And here's, we hear a little bit about his ministry in Matthew 3. In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness, the same place as Jesus would go to be tempted, and began preaching. His message was, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. So you need someone, you need friends, you need family that have been through their own wilderness that are willing to fight tooth and nail for you. Jesus himself had a man calling out from the wilderness, preparing the way for him. See, I do not think it was coincidental that we have a man, JTB, that was sitting in the middle of the wilderness, calling out for the wilderness, preparing the way for Jesus to go there and be tested. I don't think it's coincidental at all. See, here's the deal. I, thank God I had a praying wife. I have a praying wife. Thank God I had a praying mom that kept praying and praying for me, that prepared the way for me, that would not give up even when I was lost in the vast wilderness of addiction, despair, loneliness, depression, divorce, self-hate. They would not give up on, on me at all. There was an internal mental struggle that I was going through that was a veritable wasteland where her and several others of you that were in here prayed into that void until light overcame the dark. 
You need those people in your life. And let me be clear about this. Just because I'm a pastor now, just because I teach on Wednesday night, just because I'm here at Celebrate Recovery, just because I'm coming up on six years clean, does not mean I still do not experience the wilderness. It does not mean that whatsoever. Here's the deal now. I am not lost like I once was. I'm not lost, but I can still go hiking in the wilderness. You know what I mean? I can still entertain those thoughts of you're not good enough. You're not, hey, you're not, you've not really changed. We can all go back to whatever that is in our heads that tells us we're not good enough. But here's the, here's the deal. We got, I got people like Ben. I got my wife. I got other friends, Pastor Amanda, that are sending up out SOSs on my behalf. They're sending out SOSs on my behalf. The difference is, like I said, I am not lost in the wilderness, but I can still go hiking. See, no matter what phase you are in, whether you are lost or you're just hiking from that time to time, what you need to know is a simple detour can turn into your destination. It can turn into the place where you stay at, camp out, and you camp on a thought, and it ends up germinating and turning you into this foul person that is not who God intended you to be. Because you can be, the wilderness can be a place where you get revelation, or you can, it can be a place where you get devastated. You need people around you that intercede, not impede. Number two, know your navigation. See, experienced outdoorsmen like Ben, Amanda, and hunters, they know where they're going. They know how to use a compass. They know how to use maps. They know what, what they're doing with these maps. They've studied various things. They know if they get lost, they know how to get out. They have the knowledge of different geographic locations. They know how to use their phone for situations. They can look at the sun and see where they need to be if they get lost. I cannot do that. I would just get more lost. See, Jesus might have never been where he was going before, but he knew the word of God. He knew the word of God. In Matthew 4, the devil repeatedly tempts Jesus in various forms, and Jesus' reply is the same every time. It is written. Today we would say, the Bible says, but Jesus says, it is written. Every time the devil tries to, uh, to tempt Jesus with something, Jesus, like the Bible says, he knows the word of God. Jesus is led to the wilderness, and he is without food. He's malnourished, and not only is he up against the elements and the hunger of fasting, he's up against his mind. And the one thing he has in his survival bag is the knowledge and, script, knowledge and understanding of Scripture and the protection and courage and strength you can have from it. How many of you know it's not enough just to have knowledge of the Scripture? I can know the Scripture. Um, philosophers and everybody else know the Scripture. But if you have an understanding of the Scripture and the wisdom that comes from it, then you can apply power to your life. When you not only know it, Paul, but when you can apply it to your life and you absolutely believe that it's the Word of God, it can lead you out of being, the, being lost. Amen? See, Jesus wasn't using the Bible in an ineffective way. He was using it as the power, nav powerful navigational and instructional tool that it was. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they knew the Scripture front and back, you know. But they used it for control and manipulation. See, the devil knows the Scripture in the same way. And we got to be a we got to be aware of the powerful instrument that we have on our phones, on our bedside table. It is just not a novelty item. It is the living Word of God, and it can help you through any situation. Jesus himself used this Scripture to fight against anxiety and fear. And if you don't believe Jesus experienced anxiety or fear, I challenge you to read your Bible. He knows the biggest battle we will ever face is in the vast expanse. It's in the wilderness of our minds. See, the most dangerous thing you'll ever face is not the addiction, it's not the despair, it's not the divorce, it's not the abuse, it's not the unworthiness. It's when we replay those events over and over in our mind. They keep turning over and over in our mind. It's when we get stuck in that negative feedback loop that tells us who we are. See, if you have the knowledge and understanding of Scripture and you can apply that to your life, you can speak truth to power. You ever heard the saying, speak truth to power? I know it was popularized back in the 50s, and it meant fight against the government. But here, quite literally, when you speak the Word of God, you're speaking the powerful truth that it reveals, and you can apply it to your life, and it is life-changing. 
It is life changing. In 1999, my wife loves the Kennedys, so I gave this life for her, uh, this, this story for her. In 1999, JFK Jr. flew a small airplane from New York City to his family home in Massachusetts for a wedding. On board was his wife, Carolyn, and her sister. Though Kennedy was a licensed pilot, he had not yet been approved for instrument flight. What that means is using only instruments to navigate. When their takeoff was delayed until after dark, Kennedy should have waited for daylight or sought a more experienced pilot to help. Yet, being the Kennedy that he was, Kennedy took off into the darkness. The plane never reached its destination, and all three passengers were, cra were killed in the crash. Investigators determined that the crash was likely caused by disorientation from flying over open water at night without any landmarks or a visible horizon. Kennedy's lack of experience may well have led him to trust what he thought he was seeing more than his instrument panel was telling him. I think a lot of us have done that. We face the temptation of believing what the enemy tells us, to tell, believing what our mind says and not what the Word of God says in our lives. We all fall prey to that temptation. See, God's Word can keep you from crashing. Human reason will fail us at times. Man, I am the world's worst of kicking myself and replaying stuff and analyzing stuff until it bites me in the butt. But God never fails. His word can keep us from getting lost. See, we can know the terrain and we can survive the most unexpected things that life's going to throw our way. Number three, communication leads to conquering. Communication leads to conquering. If you're lost for the first time or you're someone that's just wandering or hiking, prayer matters. Prayer matters. Jesus stayed connected with his Father, and so should we. See, here's a couple of ways that Jesus stayed connected that I think we can learn from. Number one is Jesus stayed connected during demanding seasons. During this story, we're hearing about Jesus getting led to the wilderness to be tempted and where Jesus fasts for 40 days and he prays for 40 nights, fast and prays for 40 days and 40 nights. And you're like, Casey, the story only says that he fasted for 40 days. Well, here's what I can tell you. If you are fasting, you are praying. If you are not praying, all you're doing is dieting. That's it. Well, Jesus met this headlong. And I can tell you this is probably part of the reason that he overcame the enemy in his wilderness. Is that he was praying for the moment. He was preparing for the moment. Number two, before a big decision. See, on the night Jesus chose his 12 disciples, Jesus prayed about it. This big decision prompted an all-night prayer session. Jesus prayed about who was going to be around him. I don't even pray. Uh, man, have, anybody, have any of y'all prayed about who your friends should be? We, we don't invite Jesus into the big decisions and wonder why our lives are wrecked. I just want a new vehicle. I don't care if I have to pay 27% interest. And I'm like, God, why am I in debt? We didn't invite Jesus into that decision. It's important that we start praying about who is around us, where we are. It's, a, it's vital because who, we who we're around and who we're associate, associated with can get us lost quicker than anything. And this is for all the single people out here. You, can I talk to you just for a minute? And I'll go ladies first. And yet, who all single out here? Ladies? Come on. They're like, Macy's like, yeah, that's me, Casey. <laughs> that's me. Hi. That's pretty good impersonation, wasn't it? And it's spot on. See, you could have gone through relationships. You could have gone through bad relationships. You could have been through divorce, all manners of things. You could be going through everything. You're like, why can I not find a husband? Why can I not find the one? And this will leave you feeling rejected and make you questioning yourself all the time. God, I I'm not good enough. I don't bring anything to the table. Guys are always messing with me. They're always playing with my heart. See, Proverbs 18, 22 says this. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. 
Now, here's what it does not say. It doesn't say who finds a, he who finds a girl he is attracted to that he goes out on a date with, that he becomes a girl, that becomes his girlfriend, who then becomes his fiance, who then becomes his wife, finds a good thing. It does not say all that. You are not a wife when I marry you. You are a wife when I find you. You become a, my wife when I marry you. A wife is not the presence of a ring. It's the presence of your character. All right. That's it. Here, here's the deal. Too many girls and women are walking around here acting like a girlfriend. You're not walking like the woman of God, the wife of God that you are. When you start living like a wife, I promise you a husband will find you. If you start live, keep living like a girlfriend, these boys are going to keep playing with you. Same goes for the men. That's just not it. No, it wasn't just for you girls. Same goes for the men. Or the young men. You are to love your wife as what? As Jesus loved his bride, willing to die for them. Too many men are acting like boys and are not willing to make the sacrifices it takes to find and keep a wife. And all these things can leave us feeling rejected in the mind and feeling like we are not good enough from both fronts. When it is on us to live like we are called to be. Amen, that's good. That went over well. <laughs> so happy. Number two reason, or next reason, when in need. No, we did that one, didn't we? No, we didn't. Jesus' prayer session in the Garden of Gethsemane probably ranks as one of the most heartfelt things in the Bible. You see Jesus praying in anguish in the garden, saying, God, will you let this cup pass from me? God, please. So if you don't think God had, Jesus had anxiety and fear, just look no further than this right here. Jesus was scared about what was going to happen. Here's the deal. Is Jesus was all alone in the wilderness preparing for the wilderness. His wilderness was the cross. It is important that we pray all the time. You might not ever face that Gethsemane moment, but you're going to face something. You're going to face something. And Ephesians 6, 18 says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayer and requests, laying our needs, trivial and otherwise, before God. Here we see Jesus preparing for the wilderness in the wilderness. Anybody, y'all got your cell phones with you? Everybody, do you leave anywhere without your cell phone? How many times a day do y'all charge your cell phones? Be honest. That's a lie. You might, that might not be you. But how, how many else? Two, three times a day? Two, three times a day? I mean, my kids use mine. I have to plug mine up two or three times a day. I don't know. I mean, you know what I'm saying? But here's the deal is I keep my phone charged two or three times a day, but I don't expect to stay connected to God two or three times a day. I think I can just put, plug it in, charge it on Sunday, and then I'm good for the week. I think I am good. What's, hey, I can just, hey, I'm, I went to church Sunday. I am ready for everything this week is going to throw at me. No, you need to be plugged into the source three, four, five times a day, keeping yourself charged at all times. This is, this is completely useless when it is dead. It does me no good. My daughter Chloe is notorious for watching stupid YouTube videos all day that I hate. I don't makes no sense. And then when she's ready for a ride, her phone's dead. She has wasted all the energy, all her resources, and all everything else where she does not have she, her, she does not have access to a phone. She has to borrow Ansley's phone or Katie's phone. Here's the deal: is that once we are not charged. It might not be that we don't have access to God, but we don't even know how to charge anymore. We have become so isolated and so lonely that we can't even find our source. One more thing. I am, I'm kind of old school, but I know when I used to not have my charger and I'd plug it into somebody else's, an icon would come up. And this icon would say, this is not your charger. This could do harm to the battery. Have anybody ever seen that before, that particular icon? A lot of us are depending on other people's, other, another person's relationship with God and not your own. And you cannot require somebody else to have a relationship with God for you. It is not going to happen. You cannot, I cannot rely on Ben's relationship with God to get me out of the wilderness. I thank God for Ben. I thank God for his prayers. But if I don't have a connection with God, I am surely going to be lost. 
I need my own relationship with God. Tiffany used to say, uh, hey, we can call Dee and have him pray for us. I was like, no, I can pray for you. <laughs> I mean, I'm just as good as Dee. I might not take my shoes off. <laughs> but I'm just as good as Dee. The point I'm making is it's really hard to turn that mirror back and start praying for ourselves. It's really, it's really easy to encourage and pray for somebody else, but it's really hard to say, God, I need this in my life. I need you desperately. I need something from you. And here's the deal. Is we don't, I need to be removed. God, please make me like you. Please make me like you. Here's what Jesus knew. You can either go to the wilderness and get lost, or you can go there and get liberated. You can either go there to get lost, or you can go there and get liberated. See, we are going to go through trials. We're going to go through disappointment. We're going to go through suffering. We're going to go through mental struggles. See, we are going to be tempted. But just know, that, know this. Jesus was tempted first. Jesus did it first. See, the word temptation here, or tempted that is used here, is the word Pirazo, and uh, Bobby or and y'all, y'all can come on up here. Pirazo, and it means this. It means to test, tempt, to try to trap, or to examine oneself. I think that last part's interesting, to examine oneself. When you think of the word temptation, we automatically think it's somebody testing us. But wait, Jesus was here. Here's the deal. It's Jesus got led by the, the Spirit into the wilderness. How many knows the Spirit is not going to lead you somewhere that you're going to get defeated? Jesus' battle was already won. He was going there to examine himself of what his purpose was and how he was going to overcome that. And that was the biggest obstacle he was ever going to face is him looking in the mirror. I brought this, I brought this cheap mirror right here, Bubba. Pretty cool mirror, right? He loves it. Bubba loves it. Rubba bub bub. See, Jesus went there quite literally to be tempted by Satan. But he went there to take a look at himself and what he had to do and the challenges that was coming up. He knew that. See, I bought this old mirror right here. But what do we see when we really look at herself? How many of y'all like looking in mirrors? See, most of us see this when we look in the mirror and examine herself. We look into a mirror of value and we see the word worthless. We look into the mirror of success and we see the word failure. We look into the mirror of intelligence and see the word stupid. We look into a mirror of competence and see the word inadequate. We look into a mirror of acceptance and see the word rejected. We look into a mirror of confidence and see the word insecure. We look into a mirror of comparison and see the word inferior. We look into the mirror of performance and see the words not good enough. We look into the mirror of sufficiency and then we see the words not enough, period. See, to be honest, I don't even like looking in the mirror. I'm not a particularly attractive man, as Ben pointed out in the first service. <laughs> but I, I don't even like looking in the mirror that much. I can see my crow's feet. I can see all the scars that I've got from getting in fights and losing some of them. But I can look in this mirror and I see all those things that I just read to you. I can see all those things. Ben, if you look from right here, what do you see? Just from right here. Don't get closer. Well, you said just, it's kind of distorted it, right? You can see marks. That's it. Get closer. What do you say? Fingerprints. That's interesting. You see fingerprints. See, here's the deal. Is that when we can look in ourselves in the mirror and we are not close to God, we are going to see the marks. We are going to see the things that society has told us about ourselves. But the closer we get to Jesus, the closer we see his fingerprints all over our lives. The closer we get to him, we start seeing. And here's what I loved about Tiffany, and I still love. 
when I was in my mess, when I was an addict, when I was a thief, when I was a liar, when I was all those things, but I was insecure. I was all these things. I hated myself. She reflected a mirror image of Jesus back to me. She started telling me these things that I was, even though I wasn't those things. See, the Bible says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Casey, you are a saint. Casey, you are chosen. Casey, you are dearly loved. You are holy. You are reconciled through Christ's blood. You are justified by Christ's blood. You are free from condemnation through Christ Jesus. The closer you get to that mirror, the more you examine yourself, the closer you get to Jesus, you start seeing his perfected nature through your imperfections. You start seeing the fingerprints on your life that he molded you and he shaped you into the person that's standing there. And it's with purpose. It's not by accident. He made you into that person that's standing there. Now, the world might have threw the wilderness at you. You might have got lost at times. You might have took detours, but his hands never left your life. And if you will totally let him take control, then he will reveal his purpose. And you will not only live in the wilderness, you will thrive in the wilderness. Y'all can, y'all can stand up. See, Jesus went to the wilderness to be tempted so you can have victory over temptation. See, quite literally, Jesus died on the cross and was raised again for your sins so you could have life and have it more abundantly. But Jesus went to the wilderness to be tempted so you could overcome that temptation. He didn't just go to the wilderness. He tamed the wilderness. He conquered the wilderness so you could overcome the wilderness. See, we hear this all the time and being alluded to it earlier, that victim mentality we hear the phrase don't be a victim be a survivor and that's a great saying i think it's great but jesus didn't die on the cross and overcome the wilderness for you to be a survivor he did it so you could be an overcomer hey survivors tell their stories overcomers other people tell their stories so if you're here today and i know you are Because you're me. You're a person. You're a human. It's all of its nature to withdraw inside of ourselves. And to not focus on our God-given identity. And to really hammer and hone in on the things that the world has said about us. The things we tell ourselves. The lies that the enemy tells us. And we start seeing that distorted view that just looks like marks from a distance. But when we get closer and closer, we can see the plan that God has for our lives. So if y'all bow your heads real quick. I'm going to give two altar calls. The first one is for people that are lost. And they you might have been lost for a long time. Or you might have been... You know, here's the thing about being lost. Is you don't know you're lost until it's too late. You don't know you're lost until it's late. Too, until it's too late. So there's could be people here that are lost in familiarity and being comfortable or you could be lost in a sea of self-hate or you could be lost in inadequacy or maybe you just lost period and you don't know Jesus if that's you raise your hands I know there's somebody amen amen Anybody else? Amen. Amen. I see y'all. We're going to say a prayer, and I want everybody to say it with us. Say, Dear Jesus, I am lost, but I know you sent your son to find me. God, I ask you to come into my life save me I thank you for what you did for me in the wilderness in Jesus name Amen you can keep your heads bowed still this is another 
another portion. Um, if there's any of y'all that have just took hikes in the wilderness, that's your nature to just let your mind go somewhere and just be overcome by what the world says about you. See, I know a lot of good Christians that believe the lies the enemy says about them all the time. And they are not walking in their true purpose because they are constantly drawn back to a lie that the enemy has said. Or you could just be that person that lets a thought germinate and the next thing you know, you have totally retreated inside yourself. If that's you, if you have that capacity to do that, I want you to raise your hand. Amen. Amen. We're all going to say a prayer together and then Pastor Ben's going to come up and share. But I want you all to say, Dear Jesus, help me look in the mirror and see you. When I examine myself, let me see your perfection. Lord Jesus, help me to stay out of the wilderness and cling to my God-given identity. I thank you for what you've done this morning. In Jesus' name. time of worship and if I go ahead and get the prayer team to come up I'd ask Casey in the first service uh, to do this um, uh, God kind of gave me like a like a mental picture of a so a man and I uh, out in California we, we did a big road trip out there um, but part of our drive back um, actually from Reno to Las Vegas if you of you aren't familiar with the area it is a whole lot of nothing it is it is textbook wilderness for sure and there's a lot of the signs that you might see on TV of next service, you know, 100 plus miles. I mean, you just go hours without seeing anything. And they give you those warning signs so that you can get prepared for the path you're about to take, for the road you're about to travel, it, it gets you ready for that. A lot of times we want to question God's goodness and, and just look at God, why am I here? But not forget about the grace that he already sent to sustain us through that. Sending us signs of, listen, prepare yourself. You are probably about to enter into a dark place, but I, like Pastor Casey said, I know that you're capable of it. And, and, and I think it's really, really important and I want to be very clear because we're going to pray for some people that are in the wilderness and tomorrow you're still going to be in the wilderness. Tomorrow you're still going to be in this, in this spot of I really don't know what the outcome is going to be of this you know, of this divorce or whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is, it, we'd not, we're not going to be able to change the situation. But what you're going to do is have that service, that, that pit stop of uh, get fueled up to be motivated, to be encouraged, to know that you're standing around people that are behind you, that are praying for you, to, to send you on that. There's one other thing I want to say real quick. One of my favorite uh, little Easter eggs about the story of Jesus in the wilderness uh, all the scriptures, when the, the dialogue between uh, the, ev uh, the enemy and Jesus, when they go back and forth, um, the enemy will try to throw scriptures at him, and then Jesus will, in return, give him the correct interpretation of the scripture and use the scripture to fight. There's three different scriptures he uses, and they all come from the same place in the Bible. They come from Deuteronomy. Anybody know what was going on in Deuteronomy? The Israelites were in the wilderness. They're in the wilderness. Listen, this might be your first rodeo, but it's not God's, all right? God has been here before. He's already been there before waiting on you to get there, and he is absolutely going to carry you the rest of the way through, all right? Listen, this might be a new, uncharted territory for you, but it is not for God, all right? It is not for God. He's been there for you, and he's going to continue to sustain you through it. So, again, if you need prayer for and I want, for a renewed mind, or for, I just need some encouragement. I just need some encouragement that this isn't in vain, that this time isn't going to be wasted, that God is going to continue to see me through this. I want you to come up here and find someone to pray with. And other than that, we're going to worship for a little while.
at the door and a friend comes in he's like hey you want to go to a party he's like well I'm kind of hanging out with my friend Jesus here he says well just come on we can slip away for a little bit and, and he tells him oh well um, I don't know and he, he finally goes you know Jesus how about you stay here and I'll go out and I'll be back in a few minutes well the thing is, is the 
matter where we go, Jesus is always going to be there. And I kept thinking, you know, this song reminds me of how sometimes people have heard Jesus knock. They've let Jesus in. But then they go and they do something wrong or they do something that they, they feel it and they know that Jesus wouldn't want. And so they're scared. They're scared to turn back to Jesus because they're embarrassed. They're, they're afraid of what he's going to think of him, what, what he's going to say. But the thing is, is he's always going to be there. He's always right beside us. He knows what we do when we do it. And no matter what, he still clings to us. He doesn't leave us no matter what we do, no matter what we do. Amen, amen. Amen. I think it's also important to know, and, and I just keep, as she was sharing, I, I just kept hearing, nothing is wasted. Like, nothing is wasted with God. And it's important to, I think it's important to note and highlight right there, uh, a lot of the times in the Bible it said the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. A lot of times it's all just our dumb decisions, if we're going to be honest. It's just our foolish decisions leading us into the wilderness. Either way, God's there. He's going to, if it's our own ignorance, he's going to redeem that. And if it's by him, then again, his grace is going to be there to sustain. And I just keep hearing that. Nothing is wasted. Macy, your day is coming. It is coming. All right? You're not going to look back and be like, this part sucked. But then finally, right here, it started getting good. Nothing's wasted. Nothing is wasted. Your day is coming. And I don't just mean a wedding day. That's what she thinks I mean. Not just a wedding day. No. Your time to shine is that's, that's here. All right? Amen. I don't have that. Is anyone else wanting to get married? I'll give you a prophetic word. Yeah. Uh, but no, listen. Babe, can you hand me one of the bulletins real quick? Just a few. Um, I don't know if it's because, like, we are in a graduating season, but I feel like there's a lot of, uh, like, transitions coming up for people. I just, um, again, it could be a literal thing of, of switching, you know, graduating school and going into a new season. But I feel like a lot of people are in a, a transitional season. And the next, the next season we're going to is just kind of uncharted territory. So I think this is just an extremely timely message uh, for a, uh, what a lot of us are experiencing. So let's give it up for our pastor, Pastor Casey, real quick. Amen. gets to speak more than me, so I guess that says something about our speaking skills. I'm not mad about it, and I'm not going to cry about it later on. No, listen, hey, uh, a lot of things going on, graduate recognition that's going on here on May 21st, so listen, uh, anyone graduating high school or graduating college, we want to recognize you and honor you, so please come give your information. We Again, we have a lot of people graduating, um, so we don't want to miss anybody, so make sure that you uh, give your information to my wife, and uh, raise your hand, babe. She's up here. Uh, everyone should know her. If you don't, then right there she is. But uh, come give her your information. Just, you know, again, your name, where you're graduating from, if you're continuing education or anything like that. But again, we just want to honor you because it's a fantastic, um, fantastic job you've done. Also, uh, the 55 plus lunch, they're calling it the older than dirt. Um, I'm not, that didn't, that didn't come from me. I was told to say that. So don't think that that's how I see you at all. But 55 plus like I said in the first service, I said seasoned. I feel like that was a little bit better of a word. But uh, there's a sign-up sheet. Y'all are going to get together and have lunch, I believe. That is on uh, the 21st as well. So sign up so they know how much food to have. And then if you're from 6th to 12th grade, let me get a whoop whoop real quick. Six to I think that was Bradley. Bradley, you are not 6th to 12th grade, sir. You just like to say amen all the time. 6th uh, to 12th grade, where are you guys at? 6th to 12th grade. Kaylee. I, I didn't ask for a hand raise. I said a whoop whoop. Aislinn, don't think I don't see you hiding back there either. So, uh, 6th to 12th grade, our 412 students, uh, that is, uh, we're getting hands pointed. I didn't ask for hands raised. Y'all are, y'all are definitely my students because y'all don't know how to listen to save your life, all right? But, 6th uh, to 12th grade, that is our, our youth campus coming up. And then registration begins this Wednesday night. There's an early bird registration that's a uh, discounted, uh, discounted price. So if you are going, uh, also see my wife or just come Wednesday night. That's what you need to do. Never mind. Just come Wednesday night because you need to be at church anyway on Wednesday night. And uh, you get to sign up there. I think that's it. You guys are dismissed. Y'all have an incredible week. And uh, we'll see you next time.
this chip on my shoulder feels like a mountainside.